Greetings and salutations to all you folks out there. Today we're going to lock... Let me try that again. Greetings and salutations to all you folks out there. Today we're going to be looking at a game on the Mesmerizing Paradise. This is going to be one of six pre-recorded casts that are going to be playing over the next period of time. I don't know what order I'm uploading them in. So this is some time between the Monday of the week that I leave and the Monday and the Monday that I get back from my honeymoon. So... Hope you guys are doing well. I know that I'm having fun regardless of where I am. Let's go ahead and introduce all of these players and then we'll jump into the action. We've got Zwayback. He is Seraphim in the beautiful turquoise color. Yellow Submarine taking Cybern. We've got Utagbar. Utagbar. Maybe that strikes me as something German. I don't know. I don't know what it is. He is taking Blue Aeon in the rear slot, air slot, navy slot, whatever you want to call it. And then on the front, we've got Nagel in the UEF with the green. On the left-hand team, we've got Headphone Guy going white UEF. Then Brilliant Orange Pink for Agent Putin. I guess that's the equivalent of Agent Orange. Just a little bit more rainbows. I don't know. Um, Selvids, he is going red Cybern. And last but certainly not least, Shroomy in the back taking Aeon once again in the support slot. So, things you need to know about Mesmerizing Paradise. We have casted this a couple of times. I'm sure you guys have seen it before. This map is a reasonably well-balanced, hard-to-execute map. There's a lot of cheese play because it's such a huge place. You can get drops off. You can drop back here and build land factories. I have been fire beetled just recently on this map and it was a highly embarrassing experience. You got to run out and grab the islands. There's like six mass extractors in this corner and then two on the side and rear islands. And there's a whole bunch of stuff going on here. On top of that, you have ridiculously fast teching because there's the most ludicrous amount of mass I've ever seen on any map laying out here in the center. We have probably 20, a dozen to 20 T3 wrecks, whole lot of T2, whole lot of T1. And in addition to that, if you're the air player, you're going to want to drop engineers on the plateaus up here in order to snag this oh so crucial reclaim. And then, of course, you've got piles of rocks out here on these islands and all kinds of tasty mass bits to bite into. These are also reclaimable. So, Pretty much you get to reclaim the entire map out from under your feet, and if you don't do it, you're going to lose. So get on it, get your ACUs up there, we can see both of these guys, both teams have done a good job of doing that. We've got three ACUs at the front for the southern side, and two for the north, or left and right, depending on how you're looking at it, and a third coming forward. But the mass advantage is definitely going to go to the uh, left side team because they had three ACUs at the front early. So that's gonna give them that advantage as well as bringing engineers along, which the other team did not do. So just to take a look across here, Agent Putin almost, well, right at 4,500 reclaim and red 286. That's not good for being up there that whole time. He was not reclaiming at all, but he's got a highly damaged ACU to show for it. 4,300 for his way back. And we're going up the list here. Nagel with about 800. Headphone guy with 25 and 76 and 395. So not as much mass as I would have thought. There's a couple guys with a lot of mass and several without any. And this is not good. Nagel is going to die. Well, maybe not. People are pulling back. This is three versus two here. Trying to snag that kill, but I don't know if it's going to be worth it. This is going to result in a whole lot of low HP ACUs. I think we're going to see multiple deaths back to back here. Oh my goodness. Two, 100 health. 20 health. The regen on the last three shots saved his ACU. Holy crap, that was close. He is smoking even though he's underwater. I guess technically it's now classified as a fast dissipating oil slick. But that ACU is highly damaged and moving off to the north side. Headphone guy is giving chase, but I don't think there's any hope of that. Yeah, he's going to break away. Already up to 250 HP and then 2300 down here. Yellow submarine is appropriately going to hang out in the water. I like his color too. 
and his music choice. I like a lot of things about Yellow Submarine. I think we would be best buds. He's going to throw down a Torp Launcher, which is a highly expensive thing that's probably not going to do very much, so I would probably recommend against it. But that is his own thing to do, and he can do it if he wishes. Got some Zooies up here at the front. Those are going to bite into this mass extractor and that land factory, although there's enough engineers assisting on it that it is going to get finished. Then we got Navy going down in the North Bay. Navy actually plays a crucial role in this map. It doesn't always play a crucial role, but if you get Navy in the water, it could do some extremely damaging things, especially if you can get a cruiser up in your bay, because you can pretty much deny everything in the entire front end of the map just with a cruiser and it's amazing as well as protecting yourself from air because this is the central passage so good things happen when you build air fa uh, naval factories now on this side we have some engineers snagging these rocks on this side over here there is a couple of thousand mass going unused right there and a counter torpedo launcher going down why is everybody turtling underwater like a loggerhead. If you do not live in the south, that is a type of snapping turtle which can take your hand off in a single gulp. Agent Putin is going to abandon his uh, forward base there. He's down to 2k health and under heavy assault from Lobos and Zooies. I think this base is not long for this world. I'm going to go up in flames here and the middle is going to fall. But Agent's going to suck up some more of this handy dandy reclaim. Still pulling reclaim and do some more teching and building stuffs. One thing about this, it is hard to balance how much power you need and how much mass you're bringing in because things scale so quickly, especially for the air player, because you've got a huge, I mean, huge amount of mass extractors. Well, there's only nine there so far. 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, that is technically whites, but if he gets it, 15. So you're looking at uh, three or four more than a Setons Air slot, guaranteed, with a huge amount of reclaim income. That's just going to scale so quickly. When I've played this before, I have a hard time finding the breaking point where you convert from spamming the ever-living hell out of T1 power just to try to keep yourself afloat and biting the bullet and getting that Tech 2 upgrade either on an Air Factory or your ACU in order to get the T2P gens online. Obviously, the Factory T2 is the better choice from an economic standpoint because it is slightly cheaper than the T2 ACU upgrade. But, you know, it just depends on what you want to do. You will eventually need that power, though, and you can see how much T1 power he has built here. Probably not enough, to be completely honest. He's not power stalled at the moment, but I would bet money that he power stalled quite extensively a little while ago. So we got a transport here. Not sure what's up with that. And another transport there. Drops, maybe? As I mentioned before, this area over here, there's a nice little radar there. I would throw down a couple of land factories here if I were the air player, just so I would have some build power closer to the edge. And if you are the occupier of this territory, you need to at minimum have radar because a drop here is lethal. You can drop six engineers and have three factories built before they can even react. And then you can have T1 spam all over this side in a matter of minutes. So that is something that can be extremely damaging very, very quickly if you're not careful. So we got a whole lot of assistance on this factory. It is going for the T2 upgrade. DV pulling 57 mass. He is hard negative, but I think he will pull that T2 factory upgrade out without stalling too terribly much. Ah, some handy dandy reclaim. There he is, getting those rocks with the T2 upgrade. Nice balancing of the economy there, bud. And then he is going to be able to build T2 units, whether that is destroyers, which actually do have enough reach due to a substantial amount of damage here, even though they are only 60 range, that uh, UEF low range unit. Or he can go for the cruiser for support fire. Either way is good, and both of them will do some wonderful things. Now, I see some T2 torp bombers gathering here. Those have been scouted, and we have a T2 transport coming in for Nagel. He's only on 2,800 health, and theoretically, a big enough air push could kill that transport, but I don't think it is going to happen. If there were a few swift winds on the map, that would be an easy player elimination. 
Alrighty then, T2 factory over here building T2 engineers. Not the best use of build power. It would probably be better to use this T2 transport to drop engineers next to the factory and use this build time and long, long offloading time on the naval factory to produce some kind of naval unit. Naval factories have the longest roll-off time of any of the factories. It is brutal, and unless you absolutely have to, building engineers out of them is very inefficient because they build at the same rate as a land or an air factory does, but it just takes them so, so long to unload. And here we see T2 tort bombers futilely searching for a target that is no longer there. Although they could come out here and kill this naval factory, that might be worth their while. This is actually not a bad place for naval staging. Because you can fit, I know you can fit two factories here, you can probably fit two land factories there. That may or may not be flat enough. Nah, probably not. So two factories there and probably another one, another two there. You could spam engineers off of this little place up here. And if you were versus some people who were relatively inobservant, you might actually get away with surprise T2 Navy off to the side here, which would be hysterical. Might be more effective to build it on the back side of the island just to get outside of the range of that T2 radar that will inevitably be coming up on the front at some point. So we've got a land push. Finally is in action here been talking about all these hypotheticals and now we're going to see a little bit of a war but nope t1 point defense going up acu strategically placed right at the front end of the base that is easily going to be mopped up with absolutely minimal damage here comes the air going to get an engagement there and gg well played the only issue here is this destroyer there is now a destroyer up and there is a cruiser on the way and that means that this is about to get a little bit troublesome for uh, Zwayback, the turquoise player. Ah, nice bomb there, taking out two tanks. The bane of the Aurora's existence is, are those T1 bombers. Zwayback does have a T2 shield up, which is a very good thing. He's throwing up another and another. All with power adjacency because the uh, Seraphim shields take a whole lot of power to run. A whole lot. With that adjacency, it's still 218, which is just brutal as far as power costs go. But they are strong, and that is what's good about them. Going to bring it up in between the shots of the destroyer. That's going to give a whole nother layer of shield that that thing has to eat through. When the third one goes up, I think that's a pointless cause. And then the cruiser will come out, and we'll just have to see what's happening with that. We have a strap bomber. T3 Air from Utigbar. I still don't know what to think about that name. I really do not. He has far and away beaten Shroomy to T3 Air. He's pulling 111 mass and Shroomy's pulling 132, but he does have more power income and that oh so crucial T3 Air Factory. Got Swift Winds coming in. That Strat Bomber is not going to be living too terribly long. But it is going to get a few bombs off. I hate the clouds on this map. And not the best micro in the world. Did not know where he was headed. Could not make up his mind. Well, hey there. What are you doing? There's the transport. There's the engineer. What madness is this? Did you decide that you were going to go mountain climbing, my friend? Oh, well. That almost looks like he could get out of the water up there. And Torpedo Bomber is on that naval factory, which is going to go down to the hover tanks. Yenzin's wiping out that T2 factory. That is a crying shame. The Navy has gone down to a strap bomber from another T3 air player. Yellow Submarine has also gone, although he doesn't have the power to sustain it. Went a little too early on that, but it did help with the naval win. So overall, I think that's a good thing. He pulled his teammate out of danger through the sheer force of cloaking but uncloaked strap bombers got some t3 land here there is a demolisher that's going to be headed up to the front and hopefully some percivals soon to follow because everyone loves percivals and more damage to the eco of shroomy although he needs it he is still ahead 
of Utig Bar, even though he took those strat bombs to the mechs, pulling 221, which is probably a skewed reclaim number. Looks like he's around 186 to 162, so a... Whoa, that was almost bad. A 20 mass point lead. Watch your clicker there. Brink need to uh, not do such things. Shermie is probably... No, he's not going a -RAS. He already has a -RAS. Some unknown upgrade, which we will determine the meaning of later. Jester's coming in for the save on these Yenzines. Now, there's some Titans here and a whole lot of point defense. So that's going to be a total loss for the Yenzines. They're going to get forced out, and then those Titans can easily overrun them and chase the stragglers. You know what? Actually, I think I am incorrect about that. The Yenzines may have the same movement speed as the Titans. The Titans are five. The Yenzines are either like four high four point uh, seven or eight or something, or they're an actual five. I'm not totally sure. Aeon Destroyer moving in. That is from the north here, the sneaky T2 Naval Factory, which may or may not be scouted. Ah, more people off of that team. Come on, go to the other side. Aha, no scouting. That is a bad thing. So we have the Destroyer and a group of accompanying hover tanks, which means that that is not going to be an easy kill with more hover tanks streaming in. That is a combined effort of the support player and yellow, and then another strap bomber coming in. Not yellow. Um, what's his face? Zwayback. So strap bomber's gonna wing around the south side. More eco ahoy. That is the sad thing about the cybern strap bomber, honestly. It only kills the storages and then has issues with the mass extractor itself, although that was a nice clean kill with a whole bunch of NGs. Leaves that T2 mass extractor with 250 extra health. That is the weakness it has for the strengths of the high AOE and the stealth. You get those two things and you lose your brute force damage, although cyber and strat bombers are still one of the most lethal things ever to take to the air other than the donut dropping on your head or a T4 Mercy on a Control K bomb run. So much damage. Excellently microed on that strat. Nice clean kills dropping as often as possible till it gets shot down. Well done on that one. And the, one of the good things about the Cyber Strat Bomber is the AoE is so huge, we're talking 7 AoE here, that you can drop in the middle of Engineer formations, you could drop this Engineer and you would kill almost this entire group along with the P-Gens and damaging the Air Factory, most likely killing whatever unit was building in that Air Factory when it happened. So we got some Titans in. Those are going to attempt to pester to death the shield generator and they will succeed. Titans are extremely low damage units. Kind of sad actually, but they're very, very fast, make awesome raiding units, and they do have that recharging shield. So if you can dart them in and out and in and out of combat effectively enough, which admittedly is usually not worth the micro, but just saying if you can do it, they actually can regen enough health to make themselves worthwhile. It just takes a whole lot of effort that not many people really want to put into them. Why do that when you can just build Percivals and plow everything under? This choice does not make a whole lot of sense. We've got some Strat Bombers stacking up back here. Got three so far. And ASF building. I was thinking... Ah, no, there's another one. I was thinking that this might be a Strat Snipe, and it is looking more and more like one. Once you get five or six Strat Bombers, you can go after a kill and have a reasonable chance for success. Headphone guy has got the commander's shield. Excellent upgrade to be getting at this point in the game. Protects you from a lot of bad things which may or may not happen. We've got T3 on the rear ACU and looks like everybody is at T3 in some form or another. There's our first spotted T4. We got a monkey lord going down for red and no one else. Lots and lots of air building. Yellow Submarine assisting this T2 land factory to T3. It looks like he does not have any T3 in any shape or form. Strats pounding these Percivals. 
Nagel's actually in a little bit of a hard spot here. When you start stacking up 1,600 damage per shot, it does not take many firing... Oh, that's... That's bad. Percivals are all bunched up, all of them getting hit by every single strat bomb, and that is that. Need some manual spreading of those units, but unfortunately it did not happen. So that's going to be an air... That's going to be a net loss for air on the right side team, I think. But his production is good enough, and his mass income is good enough, that he is going to rapidly catch up on air. Purple is still slightly ahead on Eco, but he dumped mass into a strategic launcher. And that means there is less mass going around into air units. When I first started playing Set in Zare, and I actually had a little bit of a lapse recently where I got really bad at it until I figured out what was wrong. Um, one of the mistakes that I made was I was such a huge fan of that nuke launcher. Everybody wants the nuke launcher because nuke launchers are awesome and you want to be the one to set off the strategic launch detected alarm. And admittedly, nukes are fun, but sometimes you have to think about when and when not to build one. Now, I think it is a good time, because Purple maintained air control through the building of the nuke. But building a nuke this early on lots and lots of T2 mexes is a very risky move indeed. Because if you stall for too long, or you over-invest into that, there is a very distinct possibility that you are going to horribly lose air control. The only thing that saved purple, in my opinion, was the fact that blue was building strat bombers. If blue had been building strictly ASF that entire time, he would have absolutely obliterated purple's air control, and then he would have been free to do basically whatever he wanted with the rest of the map, and this is going to get interesting. Ah, he has an SACU named Upside Down Headphone Guy. That's awesome. Maybe he's regular ears guy, I don't know. But he is loading up with some Percivals and a T3 transport, and that's going to drop somewhere to cause some mischief. UEF T3 transport is one of the most awesome things ever created. I do dearly love them, just because of the hilarity that ensues when you drop things. Especially if you can manage to drop sniper bots within firing range on a level surface um, of an ACU. Because you can drop and instantly deal nearly a one-hit KO worth of damage with a transport full of um, sniper bots. It's basically like a T3 fire beetle drop, and it is hysterical. The only disadvantage is when he survives the first round, sometimes because of the long, long firing cycle, if he has a T3 ACU, he can build enough T2 shields around himself to deny any subsequent barrages of sniper bot fire. But uh, that is a little bit rare. If you can get that drop in, a lot of times you'll be good to go. So two methods of killing are going to pass each other here. We've got a whole bunch of strap bombers and a transport full of really, really nasty units. That is two Rambo comms and four Percivals, which are going to be moving northward into the cloud of blue ASF. We got strats moving in for the monkey lord. Thankfully, everybody's going to be preoccupied with the monkey lord, and nobody's going to notice this drop. Oh my goodness. It's way back, almost dying to that. Just barely getting out by the hair of his chinny chin chin with the help of an overcharge and his teammate strat bombers. But now, this is where it gets bad. That had a deceiver on it. That is very, very sneaky. All right, I think we're going to see an ACU death. Percival's pounding away, and boom! That is the loss of an air player. That is critical. That is horrible for the right side team. Things are about to get very, very dark on this side of the map. All of those strats are going to get a drop. That's going to break the shielding on these. It's going to take a long time to recharge. That's going to give an opportunity to this team to actually Strategic kill launch. those okay. units. And here comes the nuke. Oh my goodness. That may be a one-two punch for the win right at the 25 minute mark. Goodness. All right, these two strats will need a pass and a half to kill these, which is entirely feasible inside the recharge time of those shields. Need a third strat bomber and these two to make a pass and it's just not gonna happen. Here comes the nuke and boom. Out goes green. That leaves yellow and half of turquoise. 
Not even half. He's got three mass extractors left. Goodness, that's bad. And my scroll wheel is not wanting to cooperate. Not cool, man. Not cool. All right. Well, at least it froze up, zoomed out. Maybe it will work again in just a minute. I think it is my software, not my hardware. But that is about going to wrap it up there. I don't see any way that they can come back from that. We've got T2 gunships and T3 torpedo bombers in the back. That was actually looking pretty good for the left, for the right side team, other than the fact that Purple had this nuke. That was single-handedly winning the game for headphone guy. Um, that T3 transport in the back, the stealth transport won it, I am 100% sure. Because... There was enough air up here and enough strap bombers to cause some serious, serious damage for the southern team. I am 100% sure that we were about to see a successful ACU snipe had that not happened. And that is just about as embarrassing as a fire beetle drop. You got that stealth drop coming in with combat units, huge amounts of damage, racking up so fast, there's just nothing you can do about it. That sickening sensation in the pit of your stomach when you're just like, ugh, this game makes me sick. But congrats to the left-hand team, especially headphone guy. <laughs> Excellently executed plan. Very nicely done. Yellow Submarine is going to bow out and that is a wrap just before the 30 minute mark. Well done indeed. And hopefully you guys could pick up an alternative strategy that you can use to win. I have never seen a stealth SACU snipe. That was awesome. So something new that got shown to me in this game. I always love it when I see something I've never seen before. And good gameplay all around. Not too terribly stagnant. Sometimes this map can get a little big and a little turtly. But these guys did a really good job of being aggressors in certain situations and using everything on the map to their advantage. Well done all around. Alrighty, guys. That's going to wrap it up for this cast. Not my day, though. I'm going to knock out one more, which you probably will not be seeing for a few days. Or if this is the last one, you've already seen all six. I don't know. I am totally out of the loop. I'm just randomly uploading videos and will release them at set times. So I'll figure the, all of that stuff out later. Hopefully you guys have an awesome day, an awesome two weeks, and I will see you when I get back or in the next cast, whichever one comes first. As always, thank you so much for watching and I will see you in the next video.